Jim, thank you for joining me. You're looking great. And so are you. Lovely to be here. Thanks for the invitation. It's always good on a podcast to say you're looking great, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, listen, I want to start back at the beginning because I know that you had a life before you went into speaking, but people might not know what you were doing before. What did you want to be when you were a child? What did you study and what was your first real job? I think I went, my, ooh, three questions. First real job, I was a glass cutter at what was then Sainsbury's home base in a place called New Malden, which is where I lived. And it was, I, I mean, I'm sure you wouldn't be allowed for um, child labour laws, health and safety, whatever, anymore to do that. But I, I'm sure I was 15. And I used to do a Wednesday afternoon, I used to bunk off games and go and do it. And uh, because I had a narrative, which was true at the time, I, I was terrible at sport. And I, I used to do a Saturday and a Sunday morning often. And so, yeah, those were the days. Uh, when I grew up, I wanted to be employed. Uh, I, I, uh, I, grew, I grew up uh, for, with two, uh, mum, mum and dad had both got uh, Irish heritage, dad had come from Ireland, um, neither had been to university, both were really hard working, uh, good people and um, had a kind of terror that we wouldn't fit into this big, important, difficult country. Um, and so it was all about being employed and we had about a kind of a party when I got five, what were O levels because yippee, he can you know, he'll get into a bank now. We're, we're, so we're over the first hurdle. So, so it's a long way away from what I'm doing now. Fantastic. I love the fact that you weren't good at sport because we will discover that you did become very good at sport. And I love the fact that you wanted a job. I think it was our era, our generation, actually. We, we just wanted a job. We, didn't, we weren't particularly worried about what it was going to be. We were just terrified not to have a job, weren't we? It was, uh, can I, will I be able to afford uh, a, a, a house, kids, and do the stuff that you're supposed to do in life, you know, a, a holiday once every couple of years somewhere in the UK? So, so yes, possibly different aspirations. So how does a man, a young man who is overweight, not any good at sport, become a jockey in 12 months? That's a multi-level question. The, um, the first a most personal answer probably is um, with a, a, a full decision to do so for good reason, back to being employed. Um, I wanted to make a leap uh, away from being a trainer come change consultant, which is the, the, the trajectory I was on, um, which I was enjoying very much, but I wanted to make a, a leap in different directions and, 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 and go up a tier um, in my mind, in, in terms of my career and uh, this was a door that somebody had offered me and and it, I mean it was firmly bolted shut but someone said look there's a door there do you want to go through it because if you can prove what you're talking about in terms of personal change in that environment it'll be exciting uh, the so that's that's one answer the other answer is um with a, a lot of incredible people who none of whom I knew I had no connections I had no time to take off work uh, I wasn't a rich guy was uh, nothing better to do the uh, the uh, incredible people who I think we access through uh, the framework that I that I speak about so they don't just drop out of the sky you know we can go and interact with those people uh, and as we go on we'll, we'll talk about why is it then that we don't because we'll, we'll all have a voice in our head a quite a strong reaction against speaking to people who might be able to help us enormously but for whatever whatever narrative or data we're running in what i'll call a, a fear algorithm that keeps us safe from risk we, we won't go and talk to them and then there's a, a degree of um the many elements challenge but willingness to challenge the narrative um that uh, the data the the long-held belief that people like me are sat in pubs and ate pizza Um, because we couldn't do exercise so that was all right Uh, that was for those sporty people and I wasn't one of those Uh, being willing to challenge that even at what felt at the time of course now I would laugh felt at the time to be relatively senior age was um, to to feel challenging that I think was was critical in the process Uh, and then a degree of resilience because there are some days when you just don't want to get out of bed at five o'clock in a British winter uh, and go to work in the dark and start riding racehorses which you can't ride in the dark, um, at risk. So, so a degree of resilience too. But why, why horses? Why jockey? Why not um, swim the channel? Why not uh, run several marathons? Why was it that particular thing that you chose? That one was proposed. It, it, it was a, it was a challenge from a client who was um, quietly and well, not that quietly, uh, but without being direct about it, trying to mock my stature. 
Um, so he um, he was just saying, well, if you know, you're, you're quite a short guy if if what you're talking about works. I think he'd had enough of snake oil salesman, motivational speaker type characters, and if if, if what you're talking about really works. And, and at the time, the process I was speaking about, you know, I'd used it with my team in Apple, in um, in Barclays, in BT. Uh, we've been using it in GSK, big big organisations. We'd use the framework for change, but. Um, he was interested in what I personally had or had not done to establish it. And, uh, and so he threw it my way. And it was delicious. Fantastic. I don't know really what it involved. I might have turned it down. But, but luckily I didn't. So. Yeah, no, because I mean, as you say, getting up at five o'clock in the morning in, in a, a British winter probably hadn't crossed your mind. You were probably thinking about the more glamorous part of, of the job. But, uh, but, and how did you lose the weight, by the way? Because there'll be a lot of people wondering, how do you lose the, the weight? To be, because jockeys have to be really slim, don't they? Yeah, so I, I went down from 12 stone to nine and um, uh, I'd be about 11 today. I feel perfectly happy at 11, that'd be a natural weight. So to drop two stone for me now would be would be uh, very challenging. Now we've got a lot more science, I think, around it and beginning to work out that low sugar drinks, in fact, increase your insulin, therefore, and there's a whole scientific explanation. But back then, uh, which wasn't that long ago, uh, 10 years or so, the approach that with 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 experts the approach i took was uh move more eat less so we we um we cut out all dairy all alcohol all bread all chocolate sugar cakes biscuits anything you can buy at, at the motorway services or the airport pretty much out um a banana for breakfast baked potato for lunch with a squeeze of lemon and uh, uh, and um uh, a, a carb free protein plus plus veg for dinner uh, desserts were out and 5k every day and then um and that was an interesting um, habit to get into. Wow, I think no wonder you wanted to do it in 12 months. You wouldn't want to do that for much longer, really, would you? And I rode three times and everybody says, why didn't you carry on, ride a winner and, and do something more with it? I thought three races was lots, thank you. I was quite like, happy to get back to uh, get back to some grub. Okay, and so on a quick aside, it does, it does give one just an enormous insight into other people's lives, in this case, jockeys. I mean, for somebody like um, Sir A.P. McCoy to have done that for uh, much longer than, but this is the core 20 years of his, of his reign as champion, um, uh, uh, let alone injuries and everything else, that, 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 daily, that daily schedule, as you rightly say, I was quite keen to get off it after a year. Absolutely, absolutely. So who put the idea of free diving into your head? And, and will you tell us a bit about what that is? Oh, with pleasure. And, that, and that's a totally different, a totally different experience. And um, when I show videos at a presentation, now there'll be, there's be a, a little bit of horse racing, not very much. And then I'll show the, the final dive and invite people to come with me down to 100 meters. Uh, and we share that experience together in the room. And it's wonderful. And people always look at that and visually it seems more intimidating than sitting on a horse because we've all seen our kids or Frankie Dettori or whoever sit on a horse. Um, it, it was a far, so they think it was harder, it was far easier. Um, what, what put it into my head originally was a movie called The Big Blue, The Le Grand Bleu, which is uh, if, uh, if uh, watchers or listeners uh, or you, Maria, haven't seen it, I highly recommend it as a great watch, a Luc Besson movie with a great score. It, um, uh, and then I, I'd grown up in a world of James Bond and Jacques Cousteau in my black and white television with th three channels. And, and so um, the, the, the thought of even scuba diving was, was well, by the time I reached my early 30s, I went and tried that. I thought I, thought I was James Bond and, and I'd, I'd, I was living in a world that, that I'd never imagined. And then free diving it was almost like when you're hill walking and you see people climbing on the crags with ropes. It was almost that, that leap again from being in this environment, but could I do it their way? I thought not because that was for cool yoga people who lived by a beach somewhere. Um, and then again, it was about challenging that data in order to take the first steps to make changes. What initially, what then drove me to do it was um, my, uh, I, I, it was a growing, it was a growing fascination and the question, why am I saying I can't do that? And then, um, my um, eldest daughter became ill for a couple of years. She's fine now, but she wasn't well. And so I raised money for um, paediatric medical research, um, doing it as well. That became the final push. A great motivator. So I'm glad she's well. So, I mean, you are the first Briton to have gone past 101 metres. I mean, how did you have the courage to do that? How did you know you could do it? Um, yeah, well, thank you. Well, I didn't, uh, and the dive, I, but the dive was to, to was to, was up one hundred and one. It was it was the quest was to go past one hundred, which was vain because I I thought well 
every record's going to get broken. But if, if you're the first past 100 from your country, you can always say, I was the first past 100 from my country. So it was, it was for that reason, really, that the record could have been broken at a shallower depth. I didn't know I could do it. And I think that's a really important um, uh, flag to hoist uh, in this conversation, because uh, whenever we're looking to disrupt, innovate, create, change, transform, adapt, we don't know if we can do it. And, and we either wait until life gently shows us and unfolds to us that we can, or we take a slightly more, more um, grab it by the neck approach and, and just take some risks. Now those risks are mitigated at, at every step with free diving. It's a very safe sport. There are injuries and there are sadly fatalities and almost all, I don't want to upset anybody who strongly disagrees, but I would say, I would say very close to all of those are, are a, um, a, a, a disrespect for, for the processes involved. So there's a lot we do to keep ourselves safe. So um, it, it's, it's not that I dived in and tried 100. Um, I went and saw some really great people who uh, assisted me. One, Andrea Zuccari, now is the second deepest man in the world. Uh, he wasn't then. Uh, and they assisted me to learn how, 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 to, how, to, how to, well, mainly, yes, hold my breath which is, I'd, I'd say, the third most important. Second most important is manage um, the pressure, which they taught me a lot about. And the most important is managing our neurology, our thinking, our cognition, my cognition, um, at 100 meters or, 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 or en route in a very hostile environment. And so it's, it was it is literally going through a process of adaptation and change the, the journey to 100 the body changes in that time and then returns and um uh, it's utterly impossible unless one is able to manage what what i'm now calling the fear algorithm this 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 um constant scanning simple it's not even ai it's 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 not artificial it's natural and it's not intelligent because we now know from neuroscience that that we can't change what our learned fears uh, without input from our from our our, our conscious our, our our um from us uh, from the frontal cortex we can't we can't interfere with with what's um been learned as a fear so it takes re, re tinkering with from us to unlearn these things so i wanted to um experiment with how well I could control that in a very hostile environment and learn to control that. Um, so that, that became another driving motivator. And I used music a lot for that. And um, because it occupies so much of the brain. So I could take away a lot of the, 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 the algorithm, which is constantly trying to say no, no, no risk, no uncertainty, keep me away from risk and uncertainty. And of course, any change is packed with risk and uncertainty. A dive actually far less. But I'll still perceive that because I'm in a hostile environment. So the brain's still doing its job. Risk uncertainty, increase heartbeat and run away. Well, I don't want either of those two things when I'm doing the greatest um, mindfulness exercise and meditation that I've ever experienced. Uh, and my reward, if I'm successful, is to receive the biggest hug that the planet is capable of being, giving a human being. At, at 100 meters, you're under, you're under 10 times uh, 11 times the Earth's atmospheric pressure. I mean, you're literally being held by the planet. It's an extraordinary thing to do. But, but that reward is not available unless you can control this, this fear algorithm constantly scanning. If I see risk or, or uncertainty or uh, the precursors to danger, then I'll, I'll get my organism away, which is, of course, what we tend to do when we come close to change. Wow, I love that, that the earth is hugging you, that the world is hugging That's amazing, I love that. So, I mean, I understand why you did the jockey adventure, because you were challenged, but why did you do the free diving? I needed to. I, I, I can give you the, the logical reasons around um, being excited by, by watching others do it, and it was the next phase, and, and, um, and my daughter's uh, uh, being unwell. Um, but it was, it, 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 it just, um, it, it had to be, it, it had to be that it was on the list. Oh, it was on the list. It, That's wrong. Oh. It appeared. It was a door. It oh, was, it appeared. Okay. It was, I, it lovely. I, I do want to know what the next adventure is. Is there another one? Oh, always. Um, but they're not always headliney things. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not a serial adventurer who, who comes back to corporate to fund it. I, I, I have a very serious, well, I think, um, uh, contribution that I attempt to make in, in to, to business life. And that's my, 
my first, um, genuinely my, my absolute first priority. But I do enjoy going off to test some of these ideas. I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's okay for someone like me to stand on a stage and talk about change and risk and uncertainty and doing things you've never done before and not being afraid of, well, that's a new phrase, fearless. So I come back to that hor horrific thing to be asking people to do. But um, uh, let's no fear, but let's not be without fear. But the, um, I don't think it's okay for people uh, like me who, who, with respect to others who have a different view, to stand up on a stage unless we've been there. Uh, and so I need to, when, when I'm on the stage, I, I need to know that I'm mentally fit, physically fit, I'm in good shape. Uh, and, and in the last few weeks, I've done something that's, that's pushing me way outside my comfort zone towards a, a purpose, uh, not just because that's you know, I'm a crazy person, because I hope I'm not, um, but the, the, that I'm, I'm moving towards a purpose. Long answer to your question, the short answer, uh, I'm just about to um, complete my helicopter training and uh, a pilot training, which is um, uh, which is uh, unlike the first two, which were very very low cost. This I understand is not, but it was um, something I wanted to do for a long time. It was something I wanted to do for work, to be able to fly to events, and um, uh, and it was it really was a, a childhood ambition which never seemed attainable. Um, going solo for the first time, you move right out of that comfort zone and straight into that confusion zone again. So again, once having to operate, the fear algorithm was saying. You're okay when you take off, but as soon as you've taken off and you're flying the thing, the, the, you've got enough mental capacity for the fear algorithm to completely take over and you just start flashing red lights everywhere um, because there's no one in that seat to take control anymore. The, the comfort has literally gone. Um, and I just, just started my um, Masters of Science at King's College London in Neuroscience, which is... Um, uh, for me, really daunting because uh, the only thing I was worse at than sport at school was sciences. So um, I was Mr. Arts. So this is um, uh, so even even just the initial reading list really sent a shiver down my spine of horror. But I'm so excited about um, having a far deeper comprehension of what I think will dominate change and performance in the next within five years. I mean, it should be already within five years. Um, I think it will dominate. I'm so excited to be to be learning more at one of the best uh, universities in the world that, that it's, um, it's, it's over, at the moment overriding my, my, my fear of the, uh, even just the vocabulary in the reading. I, I love the language that you use. I love the fear algorithm and the, that internal AI that you say, obviously, we, we, we are, are constantly fighting. I love the confusion zone, uh, taking you out of your comfort zone. So the confusion zone, is that when you are sort of, is that the fight or flight zone? Is that what you're talking about there? It's the, it's the confusion zone. I mean, we're all so excited about saying, well, we've got to leave the comfort zone, think outside the box and go to new places. Well, you know, great. And I think one of the reasons why we talk about people, I think, I think the idea that people are fear change and resist change and change is slow, I think it's lazy industrial age vocabulary. Uh, I mean, I fear, um, when I sat in the helicopter today, when I feared going solo uh, that day, if someone had said, There's, go, I, I would have feared that immensely. I would, I would have resisted it and I'd have been very slow to have got on with it because I didn't have the skills to do it. And the, the confusion zone is an attempt, and then we go into detail on what, what happens there physiologically, what happens to our body chemistry in the, in the confusion zone. We never teach people this. We don't teach our children this at school. Um, we, when we definitely don't teach our adults going through change. So for years we've said, to, oh, you know, train people to, to tell to drive change and lead change and manage change and tell people their platform is burning and their their icebergs melting and that their cheese got moved and we tell them to oh, all this stuff right? and we and we communicate change. Of course, we've got to. Of course, people have to understand what's going on here. Absolutely, but what we've never done is told the the individual cells out there who've all got to try doing something new live in front of colleagues in front of customers with their with their targets or whatever kpi they're operating to on the line and at risk we've never told them like drop all that old stuff do the new stuff you'll be great off you go here's a bit of training in how to do it and away and of course we immediately meet the fear algorithm all the alarms go off one of our greatest potential threats to our existence and what are we programmed to do exist and procreate uh, survive and procreate so one of the biggest threats to our ability to do that is is being excluded from community uh, historically um, and so that that's deeply wired into the fear algorithm and so we we have a huge risk of exposure so we back away 
the confusion zone. We're all talking about leaving the comfort zone, never what it's like in the confusion. So for me, starting this MSc, confusion zone. Studying for helicopter exams when I've got children to look after and I've got bills to pay and clients to, to keep happy and, and, and research, to, confusion zone. So we're, we're going into places we haven't been to before. We don't know if it'll work. Uh, yeah, no, it makes so much sense. And do, do you think that leaders and teams or leaders of teams, I suppose I should say, if they explained this better and prepared people better uh, and supported them when they're in the confusion zone, that, that change would be easier? Yes. The reason for the pause is that the, 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 I'm sort of going through a filing system in my head of all the different things that, that go in to make it, because that becomes somewhat more complex. But where we have, let's take a simple example. We have in the past, we've had a, um, a change curve. Don't ask me, right? Or somebody who's got to increase their performance to do new things, to make more money and be more successful, make a greater contribution in their field, whatever it may be, is going to meet anger, depression, shock. Not sure. So we've, we've, we've carried this over and we've started using this. And then we've, we've encouraged leaders and managers to look at different parts of that curve. So when someone's in anger, you want to be like this. When someone's in shock, you want to be like that. I would love to turn that on that head, on its head, and it's one of the presentations I deliver. Uh, I, I, I only do two presentations, one, two sides of the same coin. How do we as leaders and managers support people, exactly your question, how do individuals go through that process, so the two sides? And uh, in my experience, the successful managers um, also want to create space for themselves are facilitating coaching their people to go through change helping them guiding them through a process uh, helping them understand that things will go wrong tolerating uh, an acceptable error level within acceptable limits having put in a certain amount of work to ensure that doesn't occur uh, so sensible error level not embracing failure and and failing faster and and uh, not fearing failure because to me that's the very definition of a loser, so I, I, I struggle with that vocabulary. Um, but certainly understanding there will be an increased error rate at the margins of our performance to date. So uh, yes, I think it is key, but I also think there are other elements. Uh, what I find very frequently is I'll give a presentation encouraged by a leader on this topic, and then people will, will come back to me, and not using this vocabulary, this is my vocabulary, will, will, will give me a variation of, that's all very well, but we haven't actually got permission to do that. On a daily basis, I haven't got authority to try something new. To to to, and my manager would get in the way, but also even at senior level, we didn't. So I think permission, purpose, and prerogative. So giving people prerogative, the ownership and accountability to operate and own a certain area. If people, we've come out of the industrial age. We didn't have that. We were cogs in a machine. Levers were pulled, and we would we responded or we got fired. And being fired had a big consequence. Uh, so therefore, uh, even even in the early days of trade unionism, in the, through the 50s, 60s, big consequence. So we 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 kind of tipped the cap, uh, and now we're coming into this age where we're saying to people, "Don't tip the cap." We and the boss is saying, "Don't tip the cap." I need you to be um, uh, more rebellious, audacious, taking risks, and so we encourage people to do that. Uh, I, they need reinforced permission as to what that means and even at a really senior level a workshop with 50 people coming together will workshop around the, the concepts we've been discussing and deeper and then we'll have a Q&A that, that all the senior people have already spoken we'll do the keynote we'll do the workshop then we have a Q&A back with the senior people on stage facilitated by me because that workshop throws up a million questions so you said you wanted to, to do x and y but actually what I didn't tell you is you know if I'm going to do that in Turkey it's going to I mean this are you seriously saying that that's okay and the chief exec will generally say yeah that's exactly what i'm saying and the turkish country manager says really um and and, a, and a, for the first time a real authentic conversation can take place about what is being asked so th there are two sides to this coin if we accept that for people to change behaviors and do new things um, means they've got to leave the comfort zone and have risk and uncertainty. We have to be able to facilitate to them to do that. Key part of that is coaching. But prior to that comes, we, we have a common purpose and it's clearly defined what we're doing here. Uh, I have prerogative. I have ownership of that. And I give you ownership of, our, of your piece of that. Uh, and then finally, I give you permission to do certain things. Finally, I guess the relationship has to shift because I have to come, be able to come back to you, Maria, as my line manager and say, okay, something is going wrong. Can I talk to you? Well. 
I've been trained since I was a little boy, uh, and so have many other generations. I don't think this is a huge generational shift going on. Um, not to come to you and say, I've got a problem. <laughs> I, I sort it out in the corner quietly, and then I, and I sweep any mess under a carpet, and you never get to hear about it. Uh, and of course, now we can't really do that because it really slows the whole game down. <laughs> and, and so the boss needs to be able to give permission for that conversation, that relationship to shift. I mean, you know, it all makes perfect sense. And actually, when you when you simplify it in that way, you actually say change is simple. And in fact, you say decision, action, result. And when you break it all down, I can see how change can be simple. Oh, it really can. And and to put this into a context, using a different example now, using the not the the leaders workshop, but but talking about now this was a, actually an incredibly it was the top. I think I'm safe to say this. It was the top um, leaders of uh, Kellogg's and, and I was privileged to be invited to join them in Lisbon uh, and without giving away any discussion, obviously, on, on, on what was going on in the room, there were, there were things, people being invited to make some changes. And um, uh, we went through the keynote around, around decision action result and the fear algorithm and how do we operate and why do I hold back and what do I need to do to move forward? How, how do I overcome this? Because my whole world is practical. How do we achieve a result? It's not theoretical. It's backed by the theory, but it's not theoretical. And then we went into the workshop where people uh, are invited to experience the fear algorithm and we do an exercise in the room where they experience it. Then they're invited to experience their data and we go to some Kundalini yoga exercises that were vital for my free diving record. Uh, and we do that, that together. Then they look at the data and then they make some decisions around what they can do because a lot of the data we hold is false. It populates the fear algorithm from the bygone age. So we, we need to move on. So uh, at the end of that, they made some decisions. Uh, and the um, the changes were immediate. We go around the room with a microphone and say, what are you going to do? As an absolute, I mean, the most junior person in the room probably ran two or three plants. Uh, at, at, at an absolutely critical level of the organization, we're having open mics going around saying, well, the first thing I need to do is this because of that. And so, so actually I just need to check with you and shouting over to someone in operations or finance or, uh, and so that, when I say change is simple and it's fast, it's because I've watched it happen in the room and it doesn't have to be at a senior level. Those people all went away with an action list from an event. They weren't coming planning an action list. They all went away inspired by the strategy, inspired by, by an understanding of what holds them back. Uh, and it's a clear permission, which I facilitated from the stage with the, with the, with uh, Chris Hood who runs Europe um, uh, to, to, to go do the things that they were discussing and if not come and talk to me and Mr. Hood didn't leave that room I didn't think till seven or eight at night because the queue just kept people needed to talk and get that permission clarified so I'm saying change is simple and faster because I've watched it to be simple and fast that is really powerful I mean I could talk to you all day about this but we've we've come to the end of our time so I'm going to ask a final question because what you're talking about now and what you're achieving in your sessions is phenomenal and I wonder if you could go into a time machine and go back and talk to the speaker you were when you started. I'm sure you weren't achieving these things <laughs> at that stage. So what advice would you give Jim, who was starting out as a speaker? Now, I worked hard on stagecraft, and I worked hard on understanding my content and searching. So I, I, I think I'd give myself, a, I'd, I'd lot to learn, but I'd give myself marks. I think the biggest thing I'd say to myself is, is um, have faith, this will work. Uh, I, I, contrary to everything I've said previously, well, I'm a human being with doubts too, and I need my coach to help me too. And I don't know if I can pass my MSc in neuroscience. It's so scary. And the, um, and I kept thinking this will only be temporary. They won't, you know, who's going to want to hear from me in three years' time? And um, uh, and so I better build some other business on the side or whatever, uh, which I would then attempt to do, and then be way too busy speaking to give it the right attention, and eventually shut it down. So um, I would say to myself, relax. This is going to be keep learning, keep moving, relax. It's going to be absolutely wonderful, uh, and it has been. So before we finish, how many years have you been doing this speaking? I gave my first presentation, not on what I speak about now. My first paid presentation would have been two thousand and three. Brilliant. Well done. I hope there are many, many more years to come. I'm sure there will be. Really kind. Real pleasure to join you. Thank you so much. Thank you.